Okay. Welcome. Welcome to Earth Day, 50th anniversary. My name is Carter M. Art. I'm the director of the uh, I'm the director of Astro Visualization for the American Museum of Natural History. And we're celebrating the view of Earth from space. This is what gave birth to Earth Day 50 years ago from the pictures brought back by our ex lunar explorers that went to the moon in the Apollo program. So today, when we're all home and looking at the Earth together, this reminds us of our larger home, which is the planet. And it really became obvious to us when we went out to the moon that was lifeless, that looking back at all the life on Earth is what matters. And this is where we are, and it's where we have evolved, and it's where all life that we know of in the universe exists. So today, what we're gonna look at is this beautiful blue planet. It's blue because of the atmosphere and the way it scatters the light. And you can see the swirling clouds of weather and also um, dominating our view for the most part, uh, three quarters of the earth is covered by water. So we see oceans and then also land, we see green and browns of the land, but also the earth spins on an axis. It spins, uh, imagine sort of spinning a basketball on your finger is that you would balance it on the spin point and that creates a sort of axis of rotation for the earth. So where it spins up at the poles is it's cold because it doesn't get a lot of sunlight, but where it's spinning around at the widest part, the equator is where it gets the most uh, sunlight. And so it's warm. And so what we see here is weather and the clouds that, uh, that this sets up these patterns. I'm going to be joined today by my friend and, and uh, colleague, astronomer Jackie Fagarty, who's going to take questions from the chat. And so we're, uh, we're here together. Jackie? Hi, everybody. Yep, I'm here. I'll be monitoring the chat and taking any questions you have about the Earth uh, as Carter flies you through some gorgeous parts of the Earth today. So thanks, Jackie. And also um, silently joining us is our pilot, Micah Achinapura. And what he's piloting is called Open Space. And Open Space is software that's freely available. And if you're interested uh, in knowing more, that's available. Our team is on the chat, so you can ask questions about how to get it. And you can do this yourself. We're looking at an image of the Earth from April 11th, and it comes to us from NASA and NASA satellite images that uh, that, that we direct into here. And as we get closer, we're coming in uh, now. Um, over South America. We're going to take a quick little tour to about five different what we call biomes or environments of Earth. So think of mountains or deserts or rainforests. Our first destination here in South America is, as you can see, uh, as we're coming in, uh, a lot of clouds. Can you see the white clouds? And then also to the lower right, we can also see some browns. And those brown, that brown band is actually um, the land that's uh, just west of the Andes Mountains mountain chain. And so the Andes Mountains in South America that run along the west side of, uh, of the continent actually trap the uh, circulation of the, of the moist air coming off the ocean in this tropical region, the equatorial region that we call the Amazon Basin, named after the great Amazon River. That's uh, basically, it's a, the world's largest um, river. Um, it has the capacity of uh, basically one fifth of all the river water in the world. And as uh, Micah brings us down lower, we're going to be uh, seeing through the clouds essentially. So Micah, why don't we come on down through the clouds? And as hey, Carter, we Carter, as we go in, we've got a question on the age as we're coming down the age of the earth. And if you're looking at younger or older parts of the earth here. Oh, that's a good question. Well, they, well, what we know about the Earth uh, can be inferred from moon rocks that we brought back in the Apollo program. They're the oldest rocks we found, four and a half billion years, and the oldest Earth rocks about uh, about four billion years. So we've been around a long time. And um, but what we're seeing here, this, these continents of Earth, um, they move around. What we found out in something we call it plate tectonics, uh, but it's the sort of um, land areas of Earth move about. And, um, but as they do, and as they move and sort of collide with one another, forces up mountains, 
But then also erosion happens, uh, basically rain that's uh, brought up, that's uh, moist air that comes up and drops the moisture out as rain over the mountains comes down. And what it does is it erodes the mountains. And so it carries a lot of dirt and a lot of um, soil and that comes into these rivers. This is the Amazon River we're tracing. Micah's, uh, Micah, can we come lower? Um, and as we do, Micah, can you tip it over so that we see the atmosphere? And um, so I'm asking Micah to tip the atmosphere over. The atmosphere is really, really thin. It's only about 20 miles thin. And the earth itself is about 8,000 miles in diameter. So really what we live in in the atmosphere is about is equivalent to about as thin as a skin on an apple. Micah's coming into an area here in the river. Micah, let's drop down. I want to see the city of Manaus in, in Brazil. It's the capital of the Amazonas region of Brazil, so the Amazon rainforest. The green that we see surrounding this area beyond the river is all forest. It's, it's, uh, it's um, the tremendous, the largest rainforest in the world, the Amazon. But we're coming in, we see a city here, it's gray. And this is typical, the, the color of cities, mainly concrete. But Manaus has a population of about uh, just over a million and a half people. It's about the size of the city of Phoenix in Arizona. So what we're going to do now is we can see actually the Amazon River. You see these pictures. These pictures are taken from space and brought together and sort of all stitched together like a big quilt. We call it a mosaic. And so sometimes you'll see pictures that maybe have a little clouds and then you might see a little border. But these are how we put this together. And um, so NASA takes these pictures, various satellites take these pictures. And um, uh, we work with a company called Esri that helps us put this together. And that's what we're showing you now up close. But let's fly down around, uh, farther down river, the Amazon. We're going eastward through the rainforest. The rainforest is on both sides of us in green. Carter, as we, as we fly away, sure. there's a question if the river is always this brown or if it changes color. Actually, as we came down Manaus, is this area where the Rio Negro, which looks kind of dark, uh, comes together with the brownish looking Amazon. The Rio Negro uh, is a, is, has less dirt in it, and it's actually clear, but looks sort of dark in space. And it flows together um, just east of, of Manaus in this confluence of, uh, of, the, of, the, of two of the tributary rivers um, that make up the Amazon. So now we see where the Amazon drains into the Atlantic Ocean. And so the mouth of the delta of the uh, Amazon River. And so we're now going to move back up and away from the earth. And this green, this, this uh, tremendous green, once again, is because of all the rain that's come, coming down off of this warm belt that right down around the middle of the earth is gets most of the sunlight. And so uh, again, it's very warm. So it evaporates the water of the ocean. And then that flows and creates these circul the, the circulation patterns that we, we see of the weather. Can you see the blue of the ocean, the Atlantic? We're going to fly about 2,000 miles across the Atlantic. And um, so we're going to come across the width of the United States is about 3,000 miles. So the distance from like New York to Denver, about 2,000 miles. So now we can see the brown of the Sahara Desert. We're coming in on Africa. And so uh, the, Sahara, the Sahara occupies about one third of Africa. You can see in the, the lower right, we can see clouds over the Congo rainforest. So above that is are these desert bands on earth. And this is caused by, once again, the equatorial warming causes the air to get hot and buoyant. So it goes up like a hot air balloon. And then it starts to cool as it gets higher and it spreads out on both sides of the equator, north and south, and creates these desert bands. So we're coming up to the largest desert in the world, um, the largest um, 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 hot band of desert here. I'm going to ask Micah to go a little bit farther eastward, if, if you can, please. These are the Tibesti Mountains. And so if we go a little bit uh, farther east, these are sort of, these are mountains that are built uh, by uh, volcanoes out in the middle of this desert. 
So Carter, like, well, just real quick, another question here uh, from yeah. eight-year-old Lily, which was on, since we're on land, but it looked like there was a lot of water. The question is, how much of the earth is land versus water? About three quarters of, that's a good question, Lily. So three quarters of the earth uh, um, is, is uh, basically um, is ocean. And so we live on that one, that sort of one quarter or one third roughly of the earth that's land. And um, so, and the land is divided up into, you know, deserts and, uh, and, and uh, grasslands, shrublands and forests. And uh, so uh, we're, we're now coming into this, this portion of the earth, about 30% uh, of the earth is uh, of the land area are, are actually deserts. So Mike is coming in over the Tibesti Mountains. And um, these, are, these are lava flows uh, that uh, were created by volcanoes and, and uh, they've been eroded. Can you, can you see, when I, when I say that, they've been carved. Can you see that in these darker areas here, of uh, this is volcanic rock. And we can see the, this carving of it in little sort of uh, river channels that have uh, eroded away. This indicates to us that this area wasn't always this dry. And uh, so about 100,000, 200,000 years ago and during the ice ages, this was actually a greener environment, but now it's quite dry. And so the oranges, can you see that sort of yellow orange color? Those are, those are sand dunes. And so this area had been carved when it was, when it was wetter and it creates these drainages that uh, basically where the water flows and erodes that rock that comes down and uh, the hot winds circulate the sands. And so these sand dunes blow around and they're yellowish in color because well, sand is really made up of like glass. It's a silica or, um, or you know, the uh, um, you know, sort of the crystal of, of, of silicon dioxide. It's, it's glass, it's what we make glass out of. And glass can be clear, but it's coated a little bit with uh, iron and, and that iron that weathers off. And that creates a kind of orange reddish color. Carter, so, quick question about something that I think is one of your favorites, which is uh, if this looks like how Mars looks, since it's so red and they've, and, and little Elliot has heard that that is also a rusty planet. Well, that's, that's Elliot, thank you for asking that uh, question because in fact, I was about to mention that, that Mars is, is essentially a weathered planet that has kind of a rust component that makes it red, reddish brown, very much like the Sahara Desert. You fly over the Sahara, we can, we can sort of pretend that uh, uh, we're on Mars, but it's a lot hotter in the Sahara than it is on Mars. So I'm gonna ask Micah to now fly higher up so that we can uh, go into some other mountainous areas uh, um, that are in the continent of Asia. So we're gonna be flying eastward over the Middle East, and as we elevate higher up, we can see the Mediterranean. Can you see the blue on the top left? That's uh, the Mediterranean Sea. We don't really call it an ocean because it's, it, a sea is smaller than the oceans, um, but uh, it's right there between Africa and Europe. So we're now going to pull away from the earth and uh, we're gonna fly um, eastward into, uh, into Asia. What we can see as we pull back is, is how the atmosphere kind of comes on. We see, we see that again, and once again, this is from April 11th. And down below, can you see the uh, blue that's stretching um, from the center uh, over to the right? That's the Red Sea, flows down to the Gulf of Aden. And then uh, we see the Arabian Peninsula. And then uh, we're gonna go um, farther east into Asia. Carter, quick question from Maggie. Uh, little mm -hmm. Maggie wants to know if there is still atmosphere in this area or if the Earth's atmosphere is gone where we're orbiting here. So the atmosphere, good question too, uh, the atmosphere covers the entire Earth. The Earth is so big that it can actually, its gravity can just hold on to air. And that's, that's what it does. Our moon doesn't really have air because it's too small. It's about one quarter the diameter of Earth. So it's too small to really, hold on to an atmosphere. And, um, and so the Earth has this beautiful, rich atmosphere that we enjoy. 
What we're coming down on, you can, can you see that river valley? This is a sort of green river valley of the Indus River Valley that's running to the bottom of the screen. But we now see a green band. Can you see the green band across the middle? And then also we're gonna see um, snows or, or the white areas of mountains. And these are the Himalayan mountains. These are the tallest mountains in the world. The green that you see in Nepal and India is actually forests. And these forests, um, are thanks to um, the water, once again, uh, from the atmosphere that flows up north, flows up the mountains, cools off, drops off as rain, feeds these forests. And then when it gets over the mountains to the left, we have the Tibetan Plateau, which is a tundra. It's, it's dry. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of a, a, a desert of itself, high desert. And so Mike is bringing us down across uh, the top of the Himalayas, and these snows build up. So here we have snow. And when it melts, it runs off first, uh, it flows in, in ice glaciers, um, alpine glaciers, so the ice kind of flows downhill, but then that melts off into the rivers uh, that come off the Himalaya. And the major rivers of Asia come off of uh, this mountain chain, and it feeds basically the water is responsible for feeding over 3 billion people, India, China, Southeast Asia. And so now we're coming in um, to an area uh, where these mountains are the highest in the world, Himalayas are. But Mike is gonna bring us to the, uh, the, the highest mountain. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It's called Mount Everest. And uh, as we come in now, can you see the sort of gray little fingers that are coming off uh, the snows here? Those are glaciers and that's ice that builds up and actually ice kind of flows, it flows slowly, but it flows down. And when it does, it sort of carves these valleys and it sculpts the mountains that we see. The Hunter, are but still... Before we quite get in, yeah. there's a question yeah, from Max and Maddie, and they wanna know if we've been also flying over little lakes too, as we've been going over the mountains. Well, we saw lakes in the Tibetan Plateau. There are tiny lakes up here. So some of them you see, and you'll see them kind of bluish color. But also, these mountains are still growing. They're growing about half an inch per year. Why are they growing? Well, the whole continent of India, a smaller continent, started to collide with Asia as a continent after the death of the dinosaurs. And they died off, dinosaurs died off about 60 million years ago. But about 40 to 50 million years ago, these two land areas came together and they're still colliding, forcing up these mountains. Micah, let's come closer to Mount Everest. Um, this is beautiful. I want you to drop down lower if you can. We are now to the north of it. That's why we see this sort of shadow from the sun. And we're looking across the beautiful greens of Nepal and then across out to India. And so this is, this is the tallest mountain in the world. And this is a good way to, to, get, to get there is to fly in open space and, and see it this way. Now you might wonder, these pictures are taken from space, but they also, from space, we can actually get um, an elevation map, we call it. In other words, we can get the shape of the mountain, and then the picture is put on top of that. So everything you're looking at is, is basically data that we've gotten from our space program and satellites, and we put it together into this big map. Carter, as we fly away, one of my favorite questions, little four-year-old Eleanor says, her mom really wants to hike Mount Everest. Have wow. you ever seen people in any of these images? We can see people, and um, we don't see any people. Uh, I haven't seen any people in the pictures of Mount Everest, but where the pictures are good enough, um, and that it's, it varies in quality. So if you come into a place, um, well, like... Uh, in Mecca, you can see the people around the Akaba, which is the, the, the black cube that uh, is worshipped in Islam, and you see this world of people. Tiananmen Square in China, you can see people. And I think I can see people at, in, indeed in Washington, DC. So here we see the mountains of the Himalayas. And also, this is the great Brahmaputra River. It flows together into the Ganges. And it's one of these river systems that come off the Himalayas. So now we're flying up. Mike is going to turn to the right, and we're going to fly down across Southeast Asia, um, the various countries there. Um, the favorite part of the world uh, for me. Uh, Mike is also going to, we're, we're going to just adjust the timing. 
In other words, we're looking at lighting because the earth spins day and night. So in this software, we're gonna we're rotating the earth to, to see the lighting change. So here we are down below us, uh, Southeast Asia. And then um, uh, we're coming, we're aligning ourselves so that we're gonna come down to Australia. And uh, Australia is a continent about, uh, uh, it's the smallest continent, um, but it's about the width of the United States, about 3000 miles wide. And it's south of the equator. So um, the most northern reach, which is closest to the, the equator, is tropical. And so again, we have rainforest uh, in the Queensland area of Australia. And off of that east coast, that northeast coast of Australia, is the largest reef in the world. And this is, this is basically a barrier island chain, which is created basically from shells. This is life over about 10 thousand years it has been building that life has been building this reef system and so it basically is a is a sort of boundary area between land and the oceans and reefs are responsible for where all our uh, where a lot of the fish that we eat are actually born um, and it's uh, home to thousands of species and um, so it's it's very important for us in um, in, in how we interact with uh, with the earth and, and Mike is gonna bring us in closer. We rely of course on the earth and, and uh, whether we eat only plants or whether we eat plants and animals, we are of the earth. This is, uh, we're part of this whole ecosystem. The beauty of looking at the earth this way is that we see the earth for what it is. And uh, here, this is called Cape York up there, those beautiful blues, that, that sort of blue and turquoise water. And then we begin to see the lighter blue. Can you see the lighter blues in here? And they're, they um, amount to sort of a chain of islands. And this is, this, these are these barrier islands that, that uh, sit off the Northeast coast up by Queensland, Australia. And so- Carter, question, we're coming yeah. in here, which I, I think is a nice one from Charity, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is if there's also, this is such a wet area, is there also a rainforest in this area in Australia? Yes, and I mentioned that, that uh, Queensland is a rainforest. So because it's the most northern part of Australia, so it reaches up into the tropics, that island just north, the Cape York I was pointing out, uh, that's sort of in the upper left area, um, is uh, basically the island of New Guinea. And uh, so that it's rainforest on New Guinea and, and uh, also in uh, the, the Queensland uh, Peninsula that's sticking out there. Um, so the, the, and the green that you see is really um, uh, green because of the forest, the tropical rainforest. So we've gone over these various biomes of the rainforest of Brazil to the rainforest of, uh, of Queensland and the uh, Great Barrier Reef off of Australia. Um, of course, uh, we've seen the mountains of the Himalayas and, and, uh, and the Sahara Desert. But as we pull out slowly here, we're going to see uh, the clouds come together and uh, completing our sort of picture of the earth. Um, and uh, I'm gonna ask Micah if uh, as, we, as we do this uh, movement away from earth is that we're gonna go into the night side of earth. When we go into night, we'll be able to see our city lights and uh, so, that the city lights show where humans are, shows where our cities are, shows where we are. And so um, as we pull away from Australia, we, again, we can see the, the swirly nature of the clouds, it's uh, the weather. Um, again, that's all set up because of the day-night cycle of Earth. It's we, when the Earth rotates, the night side is cooler, comes around into the day side, it warms up from the sun, the evaporation of the oceans, and then that goes up higher in the atmosphere, cools off, creates the clouds. There we can see India beneath us. We're gonna come around and Micah, can we go into nighttime here if we could? So he's gonna, uh, he's gonna rotate the, uh, the earth. And we're Carter, we've been, uh, as we're kind of coming down, I know okay. we've said this before, but we're getting a lot of questions in the chat on size. So could we Good. remind people, Riley and Rory are actually asking this right now mm -hmm. about, how big is the Earth? Can we set, tell everybody? So it's 8,000 miles in diameter. It's very big. 
And, um, and think about that uh, in math class, if you take uh, a diameter of a circle and you multiply it times 3.14, which is pi, you get the circumference of the circle. So 8,000 times three is 24,000 miles around. And we rotate in 24 hours. So we're now looking at, Mike has come down over a beautiful, almost the shape of a rose. You see that? It's sort of almost like a stem going up to a rose. Well, what that is, we are looking at the city lights now of humans. And in this case, that rose pattern is basically uh, the stem is the Nile River Valley. And there are almost 100 million people that live right here in Egypt. This is Egypt. And where it fans out making the rose is the Nile River Delta. And you can see where the stem connects with the top of the rose there. And there's a kind of brighter. Micah, let's move in a little bit. That's where most of the people in Egypt live. And that's the city of Cairo. And then just off to the right, of the rose is uh, we can see the coastline of Israel and further up into Lebanon and we see cities of Jordan and Syria and over up. Uh, so Mike is moving in closer now and you know, so we're gonna see some of these city lights. So we see the patterns of where we live basically because we light ourselves up at night. Carter, we had a question from Mateo, which is an interesting question. Do mm -hmm. people ever live on the water there? Well, um, people live, <laughs> that's a good question. Do people live on the water? In some communities around the world, yes, they do. And they, but they live typically close to land because, um, uh, of course, cruise ships and things like that go out on, onto the ocean. And, uh, but few people actually live out there on the ocean. Um, we live typically uh, close to water. And notice how everybody was living along a river. Well, that's because that's where the water is. So Mike is now flying a little bit uh, uh, westward, which is nice. We see the lights of Turkey in the upper right, the lights of Athens right in the middle of the screen there now. But then coming into view, can you see this sort of shape that's coming up? And it's rather distinct. It kind of looks like a boot. And that boot is the boot of Italy. It's a shape of Italy. And we can see the night light sort of outline that. And uh, the two bright spots we can see along the boot, sort of <laughs> maybe the, the boot buckles, are uh, uh, Naples uh, to the right, and farther up is Rome. And even farther up is the city of Milan and the Po River Valley that flows into Venice and Florence, all these beautiful places there in Italy. So we're going to bring the day back around, and we're going to finish up by going up uh, to a polar region. And um, we talked about uh, um, the, the, the hot desert of the Sahara around the equator. But how about the poles, even though they're ice covered, um, that uh, it's actually quite dry because of the, the way the, the atmosphere flows. It goes up to the pole, it basically cools off, and then it comes, because it cools off, it gets heavier. And then it comes down and sweeps out um, winds and, and uh, sort, of, sort of dries off that ice. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna come in, coming north, and we can see here in, in uh, this image. Carter, as we come down to, yes. which is such a beautiful part of the earth, we've had a lot of questions about the shape of the earth, and Munir mm -hmm. is asking if the earth is a perfect circle or not, and such a good view from here to talk about that. It looks like a perfect circle. Um, if you're a geophysicist, that's how I was trained uh, for my undergraduate years. It's not a perfect uh, sphere, um, but uh, and we had this concept called the geoid, which is sort of the shape of the planet. But from where we are and how we see it, it's nearly a perfect uh, circle, a circular shape, spherical shape. But that's a really good question because it does, it does vary. And of course, the mountains are bigger here and there. So we're looking now at the content uh, the, or the sort of subcontinent of Greenland. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. Maybe while we wait, since we're now uh, waiting for our Earth to come back up, I can shoot you a couple more. We've had a very, very active chat with people That's great. in here. Um, <laughs> And some, some off the wall questions that I'm gonna throw a couple of them at you. 
Uh, one from Mateo, who's four. Um, do you know how, can you explain how gravity works, how people are kept on the planet? So, uh, boy, that's, that gravity is a one, <laughs> is a great question. We can, we can, we can describe how gravity works. In other words, we understand that gravity happens because if you have a lot of stuff somewhere like the earth, that attracts other stuff and we're small stuff so we stick on to the big stuff so the earth is big and you can jump up and down and try and get away from earth but it really takes a rocket to get away from earth but so what we understand is more stuff has more gravity why it has gravity we don't really know that's a real good question and one of uh, some of the greatest physicists in the world uh, have thought of this question, we wonder why. Why does gravity happen? We, this, is, this is still kind of a mystery to us, but how it works, we can describe in great detail. It's and a we good, do that by experiments. It's a good point. And as, as an astronomer, we think about gravity a lot. Oh, it looks like we've got our planet back on. And uh, so the eastern coast of Greenland, and every year at this time in spring, the ice sheet begins to uh, melt at the edges. And so the ice starts to come off in chunks. And if we come in close, Micah, this is great. We're gonna actually see chunks that are almost the size of cities that are breaking off. And these become icebergs and they begin to uh, float around. Now, you also see a lot of things. There's a lot of white, you see the blue. The blue is the ocean. But what we see are clouds. Clouds are white. We also see the ice of, of uh, the ice sheet of Greenland, which is in the upper left. And so that's like snow. And then we can kind of see some mountains in here. And we can also see, again, we, could, we can see um, uh, valleys that have been uh, shaped by glaciers and by meltwater. But then also the finest detail that we see in these little swirly patterns is actually ice floating on, on the ocean. So the difference between the clouds and the ice, the ice sheet, it's all white. It's kind of like, you know, trying to tell, uh, you know, a, a polar bear in a snowstorm. <laughs> you know, it might be difficult because they're both white. But in this case, we can, we can see this and it creates these beautiful patterns that we see every year at this time. Carter, on, on, on this too, we've had several people ask questions. Last one I saw came from JD on whether or not the earth could get bigger and uh, seeing the, the glaciers break off and contributing to the ocean might be a good point to talk to JD and the others about that. So it's, it's interesting, the, the earth uh, doesn't get bigger. It was sort of formed uh, billions of years ago, about four and a half billion years ago. Um, and uh, so the stuff that we have of the earth is here. We have occasionally things fall to earth. In fact, last night, I, I guess, was the Lyrid meteor shower. And uh, so we still collect stuff because we, again, we have big gravity because we're big. And then so stuff is attracted to us and falls in occasionally. Um, so we get slightly bigger by those things falling in. But we can get bigger if, you know, if we have a lot of stuff falling on us. But uh, that really happened in the formation of the Earth. But since then, we've been dealing with what we got. And so this budget of different things that the lighter stuff kind of rose to the top and the hot, dense core in the middle uh, um, actually creates a magnetic field. And we're not seeing that. Join us later today uh, when we talk uh, uh, with Professor Martha Gilmore um, about what makes Earth so special. Um, but our magnetosphere that's created. But uh, what we're seeing here right now is the air. We can see that beautiful blue edge to the Earth is from what we call the scattering of the light uh, from uh, from the oxygenated atmosphere. We're really about uh, sort of three quarters of our atmosphere is nitrogen and about 20% is oxygen, but that oxygen creates this beautiful blue glow and that's reflected in the ocean. So we, we really do call earth the blue planet. And we're coming back now, uh, Mike is lining us up so that we can finish off this program coming into 
where uh, Jackie and I and our team come from uh, uh, with uh, uh, fr from the American Museum of Natural History. So we're going to close in at, 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 to New York. And when we do this, remember the beginning of the program, I showed you a city. We saw briefly the city of Manaus out in the middle of, of, of Brazil, and it was kind of gray. And it's gray because concrete, roads, buildings, things like that. And as Micah comes in closer now, what we see is, so you can see the green of, of uh, North America. Notice that light blue that we see in the ocean and then it gets darker blue. That's because there's something called the continental shelf. So we're seeing lighter blue where the ocean is not as deep and then deeper blue in the lower right now from where it falls off into the abyssal depths of the ocean. Now we're coming in, we can see Long Island. Can you see Long Island? It's, it's sort of stretching from the middle or Mike is centering in on, on the, the gray patch, which is uh, New York. And in the upper right, we see Cape Cod. That's where I'm sitting and talking to you from. And also Boston, just, uh, just off the top of the screen up there. But now as we come into the head of the sort of fish-shaped uh, Long Island, we could see the uh, five boroughs of, of New York. We see Connecticut. Uh, we also see New Jersey. That's where I grew up. And uh, so we come in closer now and we see this beautiful harbor. This is an amazing harbor and the Hudson River that runs north. And the city grew because this, uh, um, this harbor was a gold mine for transport to, of all the riches of the new world um, uh, several hundred years ago. Now we come in, we can see Brooklyn uh, to the lower right. We can see the island of Manhattan and it's between the Hudson River and the East River. And as we come in closer, we might be able to see some darker patches at the tip of the southern tip of, of Manhattan. That's where all the tall buildings are. And again, at Midtown, all those tall buildings in, in New York City right there in Midtown, it makes it kind of darker because of the shadows. But we also see Central Park. And also, can you see the blue in the middle of Central Park? Central Park is green, and it forms a rectangle uh, dead ahead of us. And uh, and then off, uh, you can also see Roosevelt Island. That's that long little island in the middle of the East River over there. And, uh, but in the middle of Central Park, can you see that blue? There's a sort of blue thing that's, that's uh, called the reservoir. So- um, Arthur, if I could just jump in yeah. for a sec, cause I know we're, we're just right at our edge of time. Okay. Uh, I wanna give one shout out here as we look at Manhattan with this beautiful grid to the event that happens, starts Manhattan in one month which oh. is right now the sun is getting itself and we're getting in ourselves in a position where we're gonna have a lineup of a setting sun with this beautiful grid of Manhattan for an event we call Manhattan Henge, which hopefully we'll be able to celebrate. It's always wonderful to see the grid in the view here. I know we're, we're at our 1240. Okay. Uh, I'll just make one, one last point. Um, the George Washington Bridge, which is out there in the background um, is exactly one mile. So the Hudson River is about a mile wide and, and the, the Central Park is just a little shy of that. But right in the middle is the American Museum of Natural History, our home and, um, and uh, the home of this software open space. I wanna give a shout out to our colleagues in Sweden who help us uh, to develop this and also to our NASA support that has helped us build open space and bring it to you today. And it's been a, a, a lot of fun, hasn't it, Jackie? It's <laughs> this has been great. I know we had students from all over, Montclair Kimberly Academy, La Cordaire Academy. I know you both were in the chat. Thank you for joining us, kids. And you can look forward to more educational content from the museum all day long, including an event we're going to do in the evening at 6 o'clock for those that want a little bit more on Venus and Earth. Uh, and um, Tune in right after this for a super cut video on Earth Day that you can watch from the American Museum of Natural History. Thanks, Jackie. And thank you all. <laughs>